Hi, I'm Kevin Lee with the eMarketing Association. My day job is I run Did It, uh, an 83-person digital first ad agency that actually started in the SEO business in 1996 with an SEO monitoring tool. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, being with Tammy Wood today, who's been in the SEO business a long time as well. I think uh, if I'm remembering correctly, she started with uh, Bruce Clay, who uh, served on the Sempo.org board with me uh, for a while. And so uh, it's always fun to get down in the trenches and, and talk SEO with, with people who've been in the SEO business a long time. So th thanks for joining me, Tammy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So my, my first question, because you sort of bridge design, usability, and SEO is, you know, what mistakes do web developers, web designers make, which ha have a negative impact on SEO? I know we could probably spend the entire time uh, talking about that, but, but some of the most common ones that you see that are like pet peeves. I'm not, not going to bash developers um, at all, because they're smarter than I am, without a doubt. They do things that I cannot do. Um, someone taught me a long time ago that it's easier to edit than it is to create. So it's not necessarily they've done something wrong. It's just I've found something um, that needs to be edited. Uh, commonly, it's a lot of uh, excess code that's unnecessary. Uh, fancy newest, uh, the newest trend that they want to, that they want to impress their boss with or whatever that is not vetted yet for best practices for SEO. Uh, sometimes the, the newest and the brightest and the shiniest isn't the best. We need to stick with, with what we know. And um, I find a lot of times developers, and well, I find a lot of times designers put a lot of pressure on developers to create their vision, which is great. But then the developer is kind of stuck in the middle where the designer isn't getting what they want and I'm not getting what I want. So I actually do feel for developers quite a bit. That's about it, really. All right. Well, I, I guess sometimes uh, the SEO person can be the referee between the designer and the developer. <laughs> sometimes, you know, um, I'm not creative in that way uh, to be able to look at a design and see that it's going to have a negative impact. But what I do now is I say, before you design anything, I need to be in that. Bring me into that and tell me why you're designing it in this way. And then sometimes I can add to it, like, do I need a lot more content? Do I need space for content? And do you have, you know, sliding banners of the fairy dust, you know, going across the screen? That's just not going to work with me. Right, right. Uh, one of the things I always like to try to tell the, you know, during during web development meetings and, and when when a, uh, a website is in the process of being um, getting a facelift, let's say, is um, you know, people often ask me like, you know, how can how can we design? best practices for Google. And you know, my response is usually, well, let's first concentrate on, on the consumer, right? Because the consumer is far more important than Google. And we can balance those two off. Have you ever been in sort of the similar meetings where you have to sort of explain that it, it's the user is more important than Google? Yes, without a doubt. Um, what I'm going through right now is a navigational change and it's very creative and it's very fun and it's very big. And it's going to impact, obviously, every every URL. And they it's not SEO friendly. And um, I am a white hat SEO to the end. I follow all the rules. But this will improve the user experience and the user journey. And that's the intent, right? That's our audience. And while, while Google may not like it or I have to nip and tuck in other places, that's okay because Google isn't paying our bills. Our customers are so right. I, I think there has to be a healthy balance and a, and a give and take and, a, and an open discussion about it like pros and cons um, I also tell the writers write for the users they're like how much how many times do we need to use this keyword and I, I can't roll my eyes hard enough to answer that question um, write for the user tell them what you want Google will figure it out um, so yeah no, I completely agree. It's all about the user experience uh, and customer journey and target demographic and all of that. Right, right. It, within the last few years, we found that the um, the sort of SEO conversation for us is at least is sort of part of a broader conversation about earned media and digital PR and trying to get as much of the SERP as possible, not just get the, the domain itself to rank. 
Um, but but in conversations that that you've had with folks who are sort of reluctant to invest in SEO, are, are there any sort of hot buttons that you find that convince you know push them off the fence into the okay, it's time to invest column? Well, it doesn't really take a lot of convincing um, for most brands, specifically after 2020 and what a unique year we all had. And, and SEO, I know, just got saturated with requests. Everybody realized, oh, we need traffic. So is it easier to sell now? Sure. Uh, what I used to tell people, quite honestly, was, do you have a phone? They'd be like, yeah. And, is it in your hand? Yeah. Then you need SEO. <laughs> Everybody else's phone is in their hand. They're, it's their lifeline. You're never far from it. And without SEO, you're not going to be on their phone. You need SEO. Um, but because I'm a veteran, I kind of I kind of just say that with complete authority and, and I don't allow them to question me about it. But that's that's basically it. If you're not online, you don't exist. And it and it, that's if you don't want to be online and you don't want to be an e-commerce shop and you don't want to do shipping, then great. It's not for you. But if you do, you really need SEO. Right, right. So um, some of the pushback that you'll occasionally hear from folks is, well, you know, Google keeps taking more and more of the SERP and allocating it to ads. So uh, do you have your a favorite response to that as well? So it's actually a uh, shout out to Bruce Clay. I give him full credit for this. Uh, day one as his employee, um, he said, I want to make it very clear. Google is a for-profit company. It's not your friend, not your grandmother. Owes you nothing. Google's here to make money. So yeah, does Google take up a lot of the serfs? It's her land. She can do it. It's Google's, it's Google's property. Google can... Uh, do whatever it wants. But you have to remember that that's just key. Google's a business like anything else. They're making money. So if you want to play in that field, you got to accept it. Absolutely. Well, you know, the, uh, the there's, there's plenty of research that shows that some people prefer the organic results anyway, right? So even if the percentage of screen real estate, especially on mobile, is incre increasingly ads. There are still a lot of folks who sort of know the difference, and you know they may they may look at both, but they're scrolling down, and that that you'll, you'll still get those clicks. Yeah, you know, research has shown that um, it really has, and, and I know you've read the industry research. Uh, people do scroll down. Uh, the people also ask is very invasive, but it does answer the question. Now, here's my thing: is and Google is trying to give the users. Google's customers the best experience they possibly can. So if they're taking up that real estate and they're using content, you know, bits and pieces here, Google's doing exactly what any other business would do, supplying the customer with the information they want. And if that information doesn't come from your website, improve your website. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And but statistically, yeah, you're right. Um, a lot of people are uh, very savvy about the ads now, and they will scroll down. Featured snippets, I think, is very uh, user-friendly and engaging. And um, while they have a lower click-through rate to the actual um, extended domain, I think they're beneficial. And I think it's prime real estate to have, regardless of the click-through rate and success of it. So, you know, it's a give and take. I was having a conversation earlier today, catching up with a friend of mine who's uh, in the PR business. And uh, he was sort of venting to me that a client had irrational expectations with regards to how quickly they could get good PR hits. And it reminded <laughs> me of the question I, I was planning on asking you, which is similarly with SEO, everyone wants the results to change immediately. And uh, I find that unless there's a, just a really sort of dumb technical SEO mistake that you could fix and suddenly open the floodgates. Usually it takes time to see the results for SEO. And so that, that ends up being another objection as you know, within the SEO industry that we have to overcome with clients. Um, have you found that uh, there's an increasing willingness to invest in SEO, even though it takes time? No, I think you're always going to get that right. Um, the problem 
the problem with our industry in general, and I've been doing this, I think it's 26 years, 27 that I've been doing SEO. Um, and the problem you're going to get is the, I'll get you in position one for $99 and 30 days guarantee. And the, it's hard to explain that to clients because of course they only see the $99 in guarantee. They don't, they don't realize what they're buying. And then the payoff, down the road is so much more negative. So to fight that, I believe that SEOs just have to show their value immediately. And one of my favorite things to do when somebody comes to me, and I still have people come to me um, and ask my advice on their website or their mom and pop's website or whatever, and I'll happily look at it. Oftentimes, just like you said, there's a canonical tag wrong, or, you know, it's no indexed, or, you know, uh, it's a silly mistake that they didn't remove the no index when they came from staging or, you know, simple, simple, simple things. So what I like to do when I'm telling somebody is, listen, you don't need a $10,000 a month package. You need a consultant. You need to set your budget and you need to invest in it for at least six months. And at six months, then you need to maybe drop that down, that consultant fee down and just keep them on call and you'll be okay you'll go forward. If you do everything you're told, then you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, but I think in any industry, you know, we want instant gratification and that can be done. But I always tell people six months. Right, right. Um, you know, it's a lot, the SEO can be a lot of fun. Um, it's obviously a little bit more fun from the content side of things when the uh, industry is interesting but we don't always necessarily get to pick clients who are fascinating or interesting businesses. They're not all, you know, producers of movies or, you know, uh, record company artists, right? They're, they're sometimes in boring categories. So, you know, how do you approach the, the sort of creative brainstorming or content brainstorming uh, differently when, uh, when it's a boring category, a boring industry category? I've had those. Um, I work, currently for a, a very tech, technical um, enterprise. I like to give them the freedom to look outside of the box. Uh, one, of the, one of the opportunities for a boring category is an engagement opportunity. You can create a poll, create a video, um, create something that will engage the customer where they actually have to engage and in doing so, they're absorbing the content. So creating interaction of availabilities is always a good idea for um, kind of those boring industries, a calculator, a KPI finance, any, anything like that. Uh, creating a persona behind your brand is something that is really easy to do. I've created many personas uh, that wrapped the brand name into the intent and created literally just created a character online uh, for their brand to answer those really boring questions, but it was a really fun character um, and create user engagement in that way. Also, there's, if it's referential content and it, it and it's educating people and that's what your brand does, then just do it really, really, really well. As far as uh, ranking goes, you're going to rank for your intended target, which is referential, informational, teach me something, tell me something. If you are in e-commerce, it shouldn't be boring. It shouldn't be a boring thing at all. Otherwise, why would you, why would you sell it? Um, but I find that there's creative ways to do things like that and engage um, and, and think outside of the box. I know uh, every industry has pound, pain points. Isolate out, isolate out the IT department's pain points. Isolate out the, the director's pain points. And you can create case studies and show, show your work. How can you alleviate this pain point? Uh, so that becomes very usable and very relative to your actual target market. Does right. that help? No, absolutely. I think that, that those are words of wisdom. Um, one of the other things we, we always like to do is find all of the different people within the, the company, our client, that, that touch the consumer and touch their customer and have them, you know, really think about all of the issues and problems and concerns and questions that these people have you know, if it's e-commerce related down to the product specific questions, um, because 
you know, n- not everyone has the tonnage that an Amazon has where they can just sort of serendipitously wait for the questions and answers to happen, right? Sometimes you need to sort of accelerate things a little bit by, you know, by engaging customer service reps and sales reps and store managers and, you know, asking them, hey, what do people ask about this or whatever? Um, and creating a, a, you know, a framework for that so that you can sort of discover those pockets of, of content can, we find can be really useful. Um, it's time consuming, it's labor intensive, but in the end it's, it's, it's fresh new content that probably doesn't exist. And, right. and, and Google tends to like that stuff. <laughs> True. You, and you have to get the stakeholders on board. So, I mean, I know that you try to ask them, you know, asking these questions and they're so busy with everything else that they don't normally, you know, respond back. But if you make it a a part of every meeting or you make it a a mission, just one answer a week and and I can pass that on. You you know, Um, no, I completely agree. Also personalization on social media. um, What I found was if somebody put their name, uh, somebody that's on their website, somebody put their name under a post, like, my favorite Mediterranean meal. I don't know, but they sign their name. Uh, that aligns their name that they exist on the website, but they also exist in social media. And it kind of gives a personal feeling for the brand in a social environment. So you're not just selling yourself, but it's like, Hey, meet our client relations manager. You know, he's fantastic. And he, is taking over our Facebook for the day or, or the like. So you'll create um, a, a human element to some very dry topics. Yeah, I, 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 that's actually a really great point. Uh, humanizing the brand and, and humanizing the interactions. Cause in the end, you know, uh, even in B2B, it's still a customer selling to a customer, right? It's, it's an, two humans engaging in that process. It's, it's not the brands selling to each other. The brands may send each other the invoices and the payments, but it's people uh, right. that are that are engaged in that. Uh, and so I think it's important, particularly in the in the world of social media, for the SEO and social media and content teams to humanize. We do. Um, I I completely agree, and I think again, 2020 killed it. Right. Um, all, all the conferences were canceled. Everybody's you know big events for the year where they're networking and and presenting so we lost that personalization for 12 months 18 however long um and we're still not ramping up yet worldwide so we have to create and continue to create not a company culture because that's you know a given people we're all people we've all been through something and we're all adapting and we really miss people so when you try to connect on a human level, specifically when we've all been so isolated, I think, um, I think that's a really big plus. That's not going to go away. I think it's going to stay. Um, and if anything, I think it's going to go keep going forward. Right, right. <laughs> uh, final question, obviously, within the sort of real hands-on uh, SEO community, uh, a lot of the folks are sort of... Um, I guess they're somewhat pleased, really, that 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 you know Google and the other engines have sort of moved from you know desktop first to mobile first, and now to core vitals, you know, uh, core web vitals, and and it, it, it's almost like guaranteeing them jobs, right? Because <laughs> now the 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 marketers are like, okay, now now what do I have to do? Like I I just went mobile first three years ago, and now what's this you know core web vitals thing that I, that I have to worry about? So any, any thoughts on that? No, I completely and totally agree. Sometimes I think Google just, I don't know, just hates me. Um, <laughs> again, it goes back to this is expected. When they said page load speed isn't going to be a ranking factor, but isn't it nice? As SEOs, we all went, uh-huh, sure, Google. We knew it was going to be a ranking factor. Uh, but to isolate it out and to give it names and to give it specific here you go, step by step, what we're looking at, what you need to do, and being so transparent in a massive change is frightening. Because if Google's being transparent, then Google's really going to follow through. And that means you need to fix it right now. Um, So that's kind of where the devs come in as well. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of developers that have job security as well. 
uh, because they're going to be changing a lot of their code uh, to align and appease the SEO people with Core Web Vitals, myself included. My company had a tremendous, tremendous amount of legacy code and, and legacy URLs, and the cleanup was URL by URL because there was just stacks and stacks and stacks of old code um, that was just unnecessary. And it wasn't dirty code. It just wasn't being used anymore. We had a URL that had 22 trackers on it, only three of which we're actually using. It's the small things like that. You're like, oh, yeah, every website has trackers. Make sure you're using them. And it, it's, it was a significant increase. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a good thing, too, because we are so impatient uh, to get our data so impatient and we want it right now and we want it to be happy uh, to make us happy and we want it to make us look good so i think it makes sense i think it's going to be a big deal and if companies are not actively working with their dev team actively having discussions about core web vitals every single week they need to be they really truly need to be get with your it department get with your developers find out all you possibly can about this and uh, buckle up because it's going to be a mess. Yeah, I think um, th those who procrastinate are definitely uh, likely to be scrambling and that'll, that'll make the shortage of great SEO talent even more challenging, right? Because there aren't that many people who can sort of bridge that gap between, you know, content, UI, UX, you know, yeah surface level code and also even understand the ramifications of a, a backend database, which may be too slow to render the page quickly enough, right? And so it, 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 to some extent, it's almost made the uh, SEO profession more arcane <laughs> than it was before, uh, which again, I'm not complaining because it keeps us all employed. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but Google's definitely, I think, keeping the industry on its toes. I, you know, I agree. I've been doing it so long. There, SEO wasn't even a term. Um, we didn't even use that term when I started. It was just, how do I get people to this website? So I can, you know, whatever, look good for my boss or whatever. Um, but we, we kind of come, you'll notice it comes full circle. So I know a lot about all of it because I learned it as it came out. The younger people that are in it now, they're having to choose content SEO, technical SEO. No, don't choose. Learn as much as you possibly can. Don't just pick a lane and stay in it. SEO is expanding and growing and it can lead to, as you said, it can lead to the whole digital marketing, you know, spectrum. So don't, don't, you know, don't just be general SEO. I, I can do keywords. No, look at the code, learn the code, write Python, learn automation you know, get in there and, and make an amazing career. I, I have, I've been so lucky, crazy lucky. <laughs> that's, that's really great. Uh, thanks, Tammy, for, for joining me and uh, sort of reminiscing and catching up with what's hot within the uh, SEO industry at the same time. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much.